and um, and we'll start. Uh, I haven't seen this question actually. The next part I've had to look at the question, but this part I haven't seen. Okay, so kinetic theory of gas. Okay, in kinetic theory of gas, we treat gas as a collection of real interact particles, right? Ideal gas moving at some speed. So we might be referring to some sort of um, VRMS. Um, colliding with the walls and with each other the coincident helium gas at a temperature of death. Okay, so we are given some temperature uh, has and we are given mass of the helium gas. Uh, at the temperature on average, how fast are helium gas particles? Ah, so, um, so you are allowed to use your textbook. So, you know, it's open book. It, textbook is not outside the help. So if you feel like uh, referring the textbook will help you answer, then great, do. Uh, one thing I'll tell you is that that's one of the reasons we have the time limit. Because the within 20 minutes, if you're having to kind of um, uh, flip through textbook a lot, you will probably run out of time. So um, an ideal student should know as you are reading this, realize that, oh, it's a question involving equipartition theorem, which in particular mentions. So I guess the way equipartition theorem goes is um, for every quadratic degree of freedom. So degree of freedom D, um, there is energy, average energy, um, average energy uh, d over 2 kbt so that's the roughest statement of the the equipartition theorem so for helium gas particles it's a monatomic so the only degrees of freedom it has are the three um, translational degrees of freedom so for a single helium um, particle uh, the its uh, average kinetic energy, ki average translation of kinetic energy, would be three over two kBT. And I think that's it because it's asking for average speed of helium gas particles. So I don't have to consider how many particles there are. I'm just considering one particle. And to relate from here to the uh, actual speed, um, you would express uh, using the concept of RMS speed, you would say this average kinetic energy is one half mass of the particle times the RMS speed squared. So solve this expression for the RMS speed. I'm going to just do that in my head. Double check me. Make sure I didn't make any uh, algebra mistakes. And then uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to plug in numbers in all from alpha because um, that makes things easier. <laughs> easier with a unit conversion. And also all from alpha can just look up Boltzmann constant. Uh, I don't have to look it up. And the temperature I had um, 285 Kelvin, 285 Kelvin. Uh, divide by uh, mass of the helium, I'll use the value they give us, 7 times 10 to the minus 27, 7e minus 27 kilogram. So that should give me some number in meters per second. Uh, pretty high usually, yeah, uh, 1300 meters per second. So 1300 meters per second. Yeah. Um, and I'll just uh, write the uh, this is equal to 1300 meters per second from alpha. And by the way, from alpha is always a lot. As far as this class is concerned, it's a sophisticated calculator. So it's not considered to be outside the help, even during kind of assessment. It's just a calculator. Suppose that this helium gas is in a volume of that. If the density of the helium gas is that, estimate the rate of collisions between the... <laughs> yeah, so um, I think uh, if you recall my um, the kinetic theory of gas lecture, that might help you. Um, otherwise, you'll have to try to kind of reproduce argument within this timed assessment <laughs> time limit, <laughs> which can be challenging. Um, but do your best. <laughs> uh, I. There certainly don't recommend watching the lecture during the timed assessment because there won't be enough time. So this is what I'm thinking. Um, I have some 
helium gas particles in the box. So let's say it's uh, moving at some speed. Uh, and for simplicity's sake, let's just let's say let's say it's moving at free RMS. I'm gonna there's gonna be some error if I do that, but I'm just trying to get an order of magnitude estimate. So moving at the speed, I can think of um, the uh, like an example helium particle going from one end to the other end. So it's gonna be traveling some distance l. I have some idea of its speed, some idea of its distance. Um, so, oh, so the time between collisions for this one particle is going to be that distance divided by V RMS. That will give me time for one particle. So for the total, um, um, yeah, it's a time for one particle. So if I want the rate of collision, it's going to be reciprocal of that time. So, you know, if it takes one second, then I'll have one collision per second. If it takes, a, you know, 0.1 second, then I'll have 10 collisions per second. So this, all of this, what I'm doing is for for single particle. So to get the number that they are expecting, where they've already given me the density of the helium gas particles, I'll have to take this rate that I got and just to multiply that with the total number of particles. And um, from the given information, I would figure out, okay, the number of particles is the density, this number. I'm gonna use a lowercase n for number density, number density, times the volume, um, which they gave us, 1.3 meter cubed. So I think that's uh, everything. So I think I can do the rest uh, in Wolfram Alpha. So um, I'll have, let's see, I want to have the numbers on the screen. Um, so I need my N, so number density, 2.9 times 10 to the 25 atoms, which is not a unit, but meter to uh, divide by meter cubed, that is a unit, so that's the density times the volume, 1.3 meter cubed. Oops, uh, it might misunderstand the M, so let me just spell out later. So that's the number of particles, and I say multiply that to this uh, reciprocal. So it would be VRMS over L. So VRMS, I'm just gonna use the VRMS I calculated above, not repeat the work that I've already done. Um, divided by the length of a cube. Oh, so I'm not given length of a cube, but since I know it's a cube of this volume, so I can take the volume, uh, 1.3 meter cube, and take a, a cube root, uh, which I guess I would do that by raising it to a power of a third. So yeah, let's see. So the number, the unit I get should be some unitless quantity per second. That would be collisions per second. Yeah, something per second. This seems high, 4 .4, 4, so 4.5 times 10 to the 28 meter, uh, whatever, per second. Yeah, 4.5 times 10 to the power of 28 per second. Yeah, I, I guess that's right. Um, I, I don't know, with these really um, microscopic numbers, I don't have a good number sense. So uh, I, yeah, that's the number of atoms. I don't know. It's at least not minus ten to the you know ten to the minus twenty eight. <laughs> so I think that's fine. And uh, and again, one caveat: the way I just estimated this, um, it will definitely have some um, uh, uh, factor uh, uh, kind of the factor of error that's uh, like within a factor of two or three. Because uh, really, you have to think about the, its motion in three dimensions. So you have to think about the component of component of velocity along one of the axes, which I haven't done. Uh, but I think I set the grading for this question generously enough that if you are off by a factor of two, the system should still grade it as correct. So okay, Percy, with each collision on average, how much? Oh, we are not done. Okay, we're still on the same topic. Um, so with each impulse, well, so this is the scenario I'm thinking of. 
particle comes in with some speed again with acknowledging some error i'm gonna say that's a vrms it's gonna collide and reflect back so the particle that's coming in it has some initial momentum that's going to be let's say plus m vrms the particle that's uh, reflected out it has a final momentum which is going to be minus m h vrms uh, i'm using plus and minus to indicate the directions so when you take the difference in the momentum, that's going to be basically twice of this incident magnitude. And it's asking for average impulse. Oh yeah, so I think this, this is the impulse, if you remember the definition of impulse from physics 4A. So I um, guess I'll just plug in numbers in Wolfram Alpha. So I have two times. Uh, I, I'll reuse this uh, VRMS that we calculated above. And then um, I need the mass of the helium atom, which I had above. Uh, yeah, 7 times 10 to the power of minus 27 kilogram. And impulse doesn't have its own unit. Uh, impulse of Newton times a second. So actually, if you want to confirm it, um, yeah, here it is, Newton second. <laughs> it is one of the acceptable units for impulse. 1.82 times 10 to the minus 23. 1.82 times 10 to the minus 23 in the basic SI unit. And yeah, part D is really the um, the thing that um, I hope you know you are kind of working through the assessment and you have enough time to think through. I hope for me uh, something like this is the eureka moment that you know explains the ideal guess law. So. Um, so it forms the basis of derivation. Uh, explain below how each of the following quantity change or don't change if it limits. Wait, what? Oh, no, so never mind. Part D doesn't actually do that. So uh, there's a missing part here, which uh, you will see it in the lecture. Um, you can uh, uh, take this impulse, impulse, and um, multiply that with the rate of collision. That'll give basically impulse change on the wall per time and change of impulse per time is uh, our definition of force. So you get the force on the wall from that you can calculate the pressure. So you get an expression for pressure, which you can rewrite into the form for ideal gas law. I, I guess I'm not asking you to do that. That's done in the lecture. Sorry, this is not very impressive. Um, but let me answer this. So uh, the uh, explain how each of the following quantity change or don't change if helium is replaced. Uh, we, so what the only thing that's changing is the mass. So the speed of the gas particle, looking back up, uh, VRMS here, it does depend on the mass of the particle. So uh, VRM, VRMS will change, uh, decrease, um, by a, a square rooted factor. Um, so rate of collision with the wall, uh, I guess that'll change because when you look at rate of collision, so let me just write this out um, explicitly. That was VRMS over L. So if a VRMS decreased, then yeah, rate will decrease. So we'll say rate of collision with the wall decreases by the same factor as VRMS. Impulse on the wall per collision um, oh, I think that actually increases. So impulse is this, two times mass of the particle times the VRMS. And here you do have to be a little bit careful because uh, let me just spell it out. Looking at the, so we've argued how uh, VRMS is proportional to, to one over square root of mass. So if mass quadruples, then VRMS goes down by a factor of two. So when you look at this delta P is equal to two times mass times VRMS, you have to do a bit of what, I, what we call scaling argument. So you recognize that this is linear with M because it's M, <laughs> it's proportional to M. This is VRMS, it's a proportional to, again, one over square root of M. So when you do scaling argument, you are multiplying this factor with this factor so overall factor is square root of m. So um, you have a factor that um, increases with increasing m, another factor that 
decreases with the decreasing uh, increasing m, and their combination isn't that nothing changes. It, it and something does end up changing, and the change of momentum that's proportional to square root of m. So the answer here should be the change of the uh, impulse uh, uh, per collision increases, uh, uh, scaling as square root of m. Finally, pressure on the wall by the gas. Oh yeah, so this is the thing. Um, so in working out the pressure, so what you what you will have seen in the lecture, <laughs> and what you could have done here is, uh, so pressure is force per area. And force in mechanics is defined as change of the rate of change of momentum. So you have one over area, which is gonna be constant for the purpose of our description. So you will have this delta P uh, times the uh, rate of collision. So this is the change of uh, momentum per collision multiplied by collisions per second. Uh, so times the rate. And uh, this portion is equal to the force. So you have an expression for pressure that goes as this. And we have so far arg argued that the rate of collision, uh, rate of collision, decreases by this uh, square root of the factor. So the rate goes as one over its scales as one over square root of m, and the change of momentum, as we argued above, it scales as a square root of m. And when you multiply these two, now there is no scaling with respect to m. So the pressure on the wall by the gas does not change. And uh, which you might have expected, if you think through the ideal gas law. Ideal gas law actually doesn't depend on the properties of the gas. It, you know, you can have a, have a super heavy uh, particles, and as long as they're not really interacting with each other, um, the mass of the particle doesn't matter. And it, this is a really uh, beautiful, wonderful cancellation that, you know, from the chemistry perspective, you would never see. Because you simply see that, oh, it doesn't change, so it must not matter at all. But, but the way in which it doesn't depend, it's a, a kind of a beautiful coincidence when you work through the physical uh, theory of kinetic theory of gas. So, okay, I'm just uh, attaching work and, you know, my recommendation to you. So I happen, I happen to be doing this because I worked through the question relatively early. So I had some extra time. Uh, my recommendation to you is don't worry about attaching work while you are working through within the time limit. That's to totally unnecessary. And in fact, I prefer to see a more organized work than what I'm going to be attaching. So um, if you actually take the time to organize your work and then attach it, I would actually prefer that over what I'm doing right now. I'm doing what I'm doing right now because, you know, I, I, I got bored. <laughs> I got bored of listening to myself talk. <laughs> um, so let me just finish doing this. And then I'll finish uh, demonstrating the logistics mechanics of this timed assessment. Some of the oddities you might have to watch out. Um, okay, put in all the work. Um, yeah. So, and I answered everything. And the way some of the timed assessment in these classes work, especially with the answer boxes that look like this, some of them are auto-graded. And um, so when I submit, I will probably receive some kind of a score. So let's submit and see. If I answer then is some of these right, I should get non-zero score. Um, wait, um, I guess. It's not telling me the result yet. All right, that's fine. <laughs> um, and uh, so after I've submitted, this is now outside the time limit. I can actually edit it here. You know, I can delete it if I want to. I can do other stuff to it. And um, now this isn't the only time, only place where you can change it. So if I do, let's say I um, there's a mistake in the work that I find later. And I only discover it after I've already done save work and continue. I can still, you know, find and change it. Oh yeah, so um, uh, this must mean I got uh, three of the answer boxes right, and the very last one uh, because it's an essay box, it doesn't auto grade. Um, so and let me do review work, and I think when you do review work, yeah, it doesn't tell which ones you got right, and um, the reason you see score at all is because of the operation of LTI. 
the way LTI works, I can't prevent you from seeing your score. So I'm just uh, guessing based on this is three out of four that I had uh, one, two, three, four boxes. These three, I know enough to figure, oh, I probably did it correctly. So I got credit for this and I didn't get any credit for this because this is manually graded. So one thing that I guess I would tell you um, not to worry yourself with is imagine, you know, you did all this and you got zero. And don't think that's terrible. <laughs> One, um, whatever auto-graded score you have, it's not your final score. I am going to be reviewing all the freeform uh, timed assessments and grade it manually. And when I grade it, I actually look at your work. So like you could have gotten 10 out of 10, but let's say you did, did not touch any work. I'm going to be deducting points. <laughs> um, but let's say you got 0 out of 10. Maybe you made some uh, factor, uh, the, the factor of 10, you know, power of 10 error, maybe. Then as I review your work, I can see clearly where you made the mistakes. Then I'll be making up that point. So, so until you see me having graded uh, your work manually, don't pay any attention to the scores you see because it could go up, it could go down. <laughs> um, now, you will see that here right now, I can't change any of these work. And uh, if you see that, so and you want to change your work, what you should do is the link I came through is actually not right. So the way to get the right link, I can just refresh this screen. Then, you, so, or you can, you can just access the item the normal way. And when you go to review work, that's the screen where you can only see things. It's a, this button that you need to press in order to be able to change work. So your answers will still be frozen. Uh, that's, this is how I know what was done within the 20 minute time limit. And, but your answer, you can do whatever you want. You can, you know, delete the whole thing if you want, uh, which, uh, I mean, don't, don't do this, <laughs> but, um, but you can do whatever, make whatever changes you want. Uh, let me not save anything because <laughs> I kind of hesitate to, uh, yeah. So, so yeah, that's the submission. Um, let's see. Um,